Good morning and a very warm welcome to you. Today is Palm Sunday as we celebrate Christ's entry into Jerusalem and also the beginning of Holy Week, a special time in our church calendar as we prepare specifically for Easter weekend next week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so as we begin our worship together, invite you to sing together as we sing Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Hark all the tribes Hosanna cry. We sing together. And so we turn to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. And so, Lord, at the beginning of Holy Week, we gather together for worship, remembering your triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which marks the beginning of a very important week for us as Christians. As we celebrate that within our church, we would pray, Lord, even as we meet in this moment, this would be a special moment of worship as we acknowledge you as Hosanna, King of David, our Lord and our Saviour. So Lord, be blessed, be glorified as we read from Scripture, as we share around that Scripture and as we reflect on what you have to say to us. And so Lord, we commit this next half hour or so into your hands, asking you through your Spirit to touch our hearts, touch our lives and help us as we prepare to celebrate Easter in a week's time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two scripture readings that I would like to share with you this morning. The first comes from the Old Testament, from Zechariah, and the second from the Gospel of Mark. Hear these words from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 10. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy. You people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Lord says, I will remove the war chariots from Israel and take the horses from Jerusalem. The bows used in battle will be destroyed. Your king will make peace among the nations. He will rule from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. 
And then from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you're doing that, say that the master needs it and will send it back at once. So they went and found the colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some bystanders asked them, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered, just as Jesus had told them. And the crowd let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the field and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the kingdom, the, the coming kingdom of King David, our Father. Praise be to God. Jesus entered Jerusalem. He went to the temple and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. May God bless his reading to us in Jesus' name. It's Palm Sunday, a day of celebration expressed in joy and praise. So important that this particular story is reported in every single gospel. A day when Jerusalem stopped to praise God and welcome in the kingdom of David. A day that marks the beginning of a significant week, what we call Holy Week. Did you notice in the passage that we read from Mark's Gospel that Jesus enters Jerusalem and amidst all the pomp and ceremony and all the singing and the procession that was happening, palm branches waving in the air, cloaks and branches placed on the ground like a carpet, not a red carpet, but a carpet nonetheless. Jesus enters Jerusalem, and once he's in the city, he goes to the temple. And Mark says, he looked around at everything, but it was late. So he went to Bethany with his twelve disciples. The next day, Jesus returns to the temple, or returns to Jerusalem, to the city, and goes again to the temple. And we read these verses from just a few verses on in Mark chapter 11 from verse 15 to 19. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple and began to drive out all those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stools of those who sold pigeons. And he would not let anyone carry anything through the temple courtyards. He then taught the people. It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations, but you have turned it into a hideout for thieves. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, so they began looking for some way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teachings. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples left the city. Just imagine if you entered checkers or pick and pay, you wouldn't expect to find people sitting in small groups reading the Bible and praying. If you went to the library you wouldn't expect to find people dressed in sports gear and playing rugby. If you went to a restaurant, you wouldn't expect to find people lying on gym mats and doing Pilates. 
when Jesus went to the temple the day before the scene infuriated him. He was mad and he went home or he went to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Why was Jesus mad? What he saw in the temple was not what he expected. He expected to find people worshipping God. Instead, what he found was people being conned. He expected to find people praising and praying to God. Instead, there was the sound of profit and commerce. He expected to find people glorifying God in their worship. Instead, he found corruption of the human heart. So Jesus leaves the city and returns the next day. In John's Gospel, he gives us a maybe a more graphic description of what happens. So hear these words and just try and imagine the scene as I read the passage from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. It was almost time for the Passover festival, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. It was Passover at the time when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. There in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and pigeons, and also the money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip from cords and drove all the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. And he ordered those who sold the pigeons, take them out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Here's the expanded version of that. It was almost time for the Passover festival. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. A significant moment in the life of a Jew was when they went to Jerusalem to visit the temple. It was the time of the Passover. Thousands and thousands of Jews would have been traveling to Jerusalem to come and worship, to be part of the Passover festivals. There in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and pigeons, and also the money changers sitting at their tables. There was chaos in the temple. It was a hive of activity. There was busyness and business. Not what Jesus would have expected to find in the temple. So John's gospel tells us that he spends time making a whip. That took time. This wasn't a reaction thing that Jesus was part of. This was a thought through act of disruption, of upset. In Mark's gospel, we told that Jesus saw what was happening in the temple and he went home. It was the next day that he came back. Again, Jesus has probably spent the whole night thinking about what to do, how to address the situation. And so Jesus took his time. And once he'd made his cord in John's gospel, it says, and he drove all the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He opened the pens. He untethered the animals. Maybe opened the cages. He began to move around fast and quick. He overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. Jesus is disrupting business. Jesus is causing chaos in what was already chaos in the context of the temple. But he's creating even more chaos. And so he ordered those who sold the pigeons, take them out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus responds. Jesus acts with authority. This is the temple. The temple is not being used for what it should be. And so Jesus clears the temple. Now remember, irrespective of which gospel you read, 
The temple was central to the people's worship. That is where people met with God. That was where the high priest met with God. In the context of scripture and of the Old Testament, God resided, lived within the temple. That was where you came to meet God. God could be found in the temple. God lived there, if you like. The temple is the place where people should be able to come close to God. The priests were supposed to be the people there, the officials who were helping people to come close to God. But the priests end up alienating the people. The priests were supposed to be those helping people to discover truth and honesty. Instead, the priests had replaced that with greed and corruption. The temple was supposed to be a place of prayer. A place where people could draw close to God, but it had been turned into a hideout for thieves. Became a busy house became a place where they could con people. At the temple, Jesus was disrupting and disturbing. He was unsettling the institution. He was challenging the structures because the temple had become something that God never intended it to be. Jesus disrupts the temple and what is happening there. In the Old Testament, as we said, the temple was the dwelling place of God and the Spirit of God lived there. In the New Testament, the temple moves. In the New Testament, we know that God no longer resides in the building. But in our understanding of faith and Christianity, and post-resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the temple is no longer a building. God moves into our hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Surely you know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. We are God's temple. And Jesus is always the one who enters the temple and sometimes disrupts, sometimes disturbs our lives as we follow him. Jesus boldly confronts and examines us in how we worship, in how we trust in him, in how we live. Jesus comes to clear what is not of God in our lives. Jesus comes today to clear his temple. What in our lives is not what God intends it to be? Where is our worship lacking? Where are our lives not measuring up? What in our lives needs to be cleared out so that we can have a closer walk with God? So that God can be even more present, if you like. That God can fill us. Jesus cleared the temple then. Jesus needs to clear his temple in our hearts and our lives today. And so as we head into this Holy Week, I hope and pray that you're able to spend some time preparing for Easter but as we head into Holy Week, may we let Jesus clear our lives. May we let Jesus clear his temple and prepare us for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. May we be open to have our lives cleared so that God can get rid of everything that is not of God in our lives. Let us pray. And so, Lord, it is our prayer that as we head into Holy Week, that we would be reminded again of all that you've done for us. 
But even as we're reminded about that, Lord, we become very aware of our shortcomings, of our failures. Lord, we have not loved you with all our hearts, souls, mind and strength. We've not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We've not loved one another as Christ has loved us. We've not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, clear and cleanse our hearts, we pray. We confess to you, O God, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy and impatience of our lives, our self-indulgence and our exploitation of other people. Lord, in your mercy, clear and cleanse our lives, our hearts. Lord, we confess our preoccupation with worldly goods and comforts and also our envy of others. Lord, in your mercy, clear and cleanse our hearts. Lord, we confess our blindness to human need and suffering, our indifference to injustice and cruelty, our misuse and pollution of creation. And we confess, Lord, our lack of concern for the generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, clear and cleanse our hearts. Lord, we confess our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Lord, in your mercy, clear and cleanse our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, your cleansing and the clearing of your temple our lives and we pray lord that all glory will be given to you may you have your way in us we pray this in the all-powerful name of jesus christ our lord and our savior amen and so I invite you to join us in our final song as we sing together rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee.
Thank you for sharing with us, and I pray that you would have a blessed Holy Week, and that as you celebrate Easter in this coming weekend, that you would be blessed. And so may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.